Hello and welcome to the second video in my series on third party rights and unregistered land. In this video I'm going to take you through how to work out whether a property right can be registered as a land charge by looking at the relevant legislation and breaking it down into bite sized pieces. I'm going to focus on the most common land charges and the ones which will typically come up in an assessment. The relevant law is in Section 2 of the Land Charges Act 1972, which replaced the original 1925 legislation. What I've done on this slide is to list the most important categories of land charges, and so the ones that you're most likely to encounter. You may remember that the system of land charges was intended to be a temporary system to replace the common law system of the Doctrine of Notice to deal with proprietary rights until titles to the land became fully registered. So what we'll see is that some rights are only registrable if they were created after the land charges system was introduced in 1925, and they are restrictive covenants and equitable easements, which are indicated by the blue arrows there. And just to stress, if you're new to studying land law, don't worry if you don't know what these rights actually are at the moment, as you will study them in more detail later. And the thing to note is that the legislation puts the different rights into different classes. That's the information in the green arrows on the left hand side. So we refer to land charges by reference to their class, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So let's now look at section 2 in more detail and pull out the most important parts. And just a quick word of advice, I would always encourage you to get used to looking at the statutory provisions themselves. Don't try and remember them unless you are absolutely forced to. So if you can take your own copy of a property law statute book into the exam, buy one now and get used to using it. And if you have a coursework as an assessment, then always have the text of the statute handy to refer to. So here's the first part of section 2 that we need to be aware of, and unfortunately this one is a bit of an anomaly, which isn't a great start. So here you can see that we call it a Class C land charge, because that's what the section tells us. And we refer to it as a Class C1, because it's in subsection 1, which you can see indicated by the arrow there. And the reason this one is an anomaly is because it's the only legal interest which is registrable as a land charge. And the reason for this is that the mortgagee, so that's the lender, which is the bank or the building society usually, will hold the title deeds to the land as security to prevent the owner from selling the land without their knowledge or consent. But for later lenders, so for example, if the landowner takes out another mortgage to pay for home improvements or as capital for a new business venture, then the second mortgagee can't take the title deeds to protect their security because the first mortgagee has got them. So second or third or fourth mortgagees can protect their interests in the property by registering it as a land charge. And whilst we have this, the text of section 2.4 in front of us, which sets out class C land charges, just look at C3, indicated by the red arrow there, because you might think that the wording suggests that this is a very wide catch-all provision which in a way it is, but I just want to confirm that it only relates to charges in relation to the protection for payment for money. So it doesn't include any other general type of property rights. In other words, it doesn't mop up every other type of equitable proprietary right, which isn't specifically listed in section 2. OK, now let's look at C4 land charges and unfortunately they're not easy to get to grips with either when you're first starting to study land law and they are a fertile ground for assessment questions. 
it's quite a broad category and in practical terms it can be very important. If you stick around to the end, I will look at a couple of examples of a C4 land charge and it's probably something that you should revisit when you're revising rather than when you're just starting out. So I will warn you about that when it comes up. But for now, what you'll see is that a C4 is an estate contract. So it relates to contracts in relation to the ownership of land. Now, transactions in land for transferring estates and creating new interests will often be preceded by a contract. So when someone buys land and a price has been agreed, there will usually be a delay while the purchaser's lawyer carries out extensive inquiries relating to the land to ensure that there are no adverse rights affecting it. During this time, neither party is committed to the sale and it notoriously provides an opportunity for either side to withdraw from the transaction. So, for example, when property prices are rising, the seller may receive and accept a higher offer from another buyer. But when both parties are ready to proceed, they will enter into a contract of sale, which will then bind them both to the sale. So this will happen prior to the actual transfer of the title to the land or the creation of the new interest, which are done at a later date. If you look at the section, you'll see that an estate contract is defined and it specifically refers to a contract to buy land or a contract to create a new estate in land. So it would include, for example, a new lease or to buy a freehold estate or to grant a new easement. And what you'll also see is that it includes options to purchase land, which is a right granted by a landowner to a third party for the third party to be able to buy the land. Now, if the third party chooses to exercise the right, then the estate owner is then required to sell the land to the third party. Now, that might seem a little strange, but a common example would be where a developer would pay the estate owner to secure an option to purchase the land if the developer thought that they might be able to get planning permission to develop. So they might buy an option over farmland to see if they can get planning permission to build a new housing estate on the land. And before they put a lot of time and money into putting in a planning application, they want to make sure that the estate owner can't sell the land to somebody else in the meantime. So they will pay the estate owner for an option to purchase the land. You'll see that something called a right of preemption is also within the definition of an estate contract. A right of preemption is similar to an option to purchase, but very slightly different. This is where the third party has a right of first refusal if the property owner decides to sell. And then finally, you'll see that there's a general mop-up provision. So that would be any other type of contract relating to land, which isn't specifically defined there. So they would also be registrable as a C4 land charge. So next we have D2 land charges, which are restrictive freehold covenants. Now, if you're new to studying land law, a restrictive covenant is essentially a promise made in a deed by a landowner not to do something on their land. So, for example, if the owner of a large plot of land sells off some of the land, they might want the new owner of the smaller plot to promise only to use the land for a particular purpose. For example, only to build one house on it or only to use it for residential purposes. And that promise in the deed would be a restrictive covenant. And just like other property rights, this promise can be enforced between later owners of the land. So not just the original parties to the agreement. Highlighted in red, you'll see that covenants between a lessor and a lessee are excluded. And we know that by the words other than. So that means that these types of covenants are excluded. 
A lessor and a lessee are simply the technical terms to refer to a landlord and a tenant. So the exception refers to covenants in a lease. So you can't register any restrictive terms in a lease as a D2 land charge. So that's why D2 land charges only apply to freehold covenants. And finally, also note that it's only restrictive covenants which were created after the system was introduced. So only restrictive covenants which were entered into post-1925 can be registered within Section 2. And just to stress that all the information is there in the statute, so you don't have to try and remember it if you have your property law statute book with you in an exam. Next are equitable easements and as you can see again only post 1925 equitable easements can be registered as a D3 land charge. And of course if it's a legal easement it will bind the purchaser under the rule that legal rights bind the whole world anyway so there's no need for the third party who has the benefit of a legal easement to protect it. But if it's an equitable easement, then they should protect it by registering a land charge against the name of the estate owner. And the final one we're going to look at are Class F land charges, which are called home rights. And a home right is a right of occupation for certain types of occupiers of property. And this right comes from the Family Law Act 1996. And it gives an automatic right of occupation to occupiers who are not a legal owner of the land. Now, the short title of the Act, the Family Law Act, might give you a clue as to which type of occupiers fall within a Class F land charge. And they are spouses or civil partners who are occupying the property. So the right isn't a form of ownership in the home. It's simply a right of occupation. Now, in practice, the significance of Class F land charges has been reduced considerably in recent years because married couples and civil partners who buy a property nowadays tend to buy it in their joint names. So they're both legal owners and a Class F land charge is only registered where a spouse or civil partner is not a legal owner of the property. But it could be relevant, for example, if one spouse or partner moved into a house which was already owned by the other spouse or partner and the house is in their sole name. And for those of you who have studied trusts of the family home, just know that this right of occupation is in addition to any equitable proprietary rights that a spouse or civil partner has who doesn't hold the legal title. So just to recap, here are the most important categories of land charge that we've looked at and the ones that you're most likely to encounter in in an assessment. And did you notice that with the exception of home rights, these rights are all likely to have been granted for money. So they would have been part of a commercial transaction. So, for example, restrictive covenants and easements, such as a right of way or a right of drainage, are likely to increase the value of the land which has the benefit of those rights. So it's important that these rights continue on after the land which is subject to those rights is sold and that the people who are benefiting from those rights are able to protect them. And on this slide is a list of property rights which can't be registered as a land charge. And as you'll see, the top one there in blue may fall within the system of overreaching, which is something that I'm going to cover in a later video. All the remaining rights will all fall under the doctrine of notice, which is going to be the subject of the next video. So that's all I have to say about section two. What I'm going to do now is to look at some examples. If you decide to stop watching here, thank you so much for watching and please subscribe, like or share my videos. But hopefully you will stay watching. And the issue that we're going to consider in relation to all of these property rights is whether they are registrable as a land charge. 
and I'm going to use the IRAC method, which I try to do in all my videos. And IRAC stands for Issue, Rule, Application and Conclusion. So the first one we're going to look at is an equitable easement. And remember that the general issue we're considering is whether it can be registered as a land charge. The relevant rule is in section two of the Land Charges Act 1972, which tells us which type of rights can be registered as a land charge. And in subsection five, we'll see that it refers to equitable easements, which were granted on or after the 1st of January 1926. So in other words, after 1925. So if we apply that rule, well, the facts state that it is an equitable easement and it was granted in 1935. So it has been granted after the 1st of January 1926. So we can conclude that this can be registered as a land charge. And as you know, if it isn't registered, then it won't be binding on a purchaser of the land. So the next one is still an equitable easement, but this time it was granted in 1884. So we're applying the same rule. The facts state that it's equitable, but this time it wasn't granted after 1925. So we can conclude that it doesn't fall within the land charges system. The next one is a restrictive freehold covenant granted by deed in 1927. And the rule is that restrictive covenants, other than those in a lease, can be registered as a land charge so long as they were created on or after the 1st of January 1926. So if you apply that rule, well, it isn't a leasehold covenant. We're told it's a freehold covenant and it was granted after 1925. So we can conclude that it can be registered as a land charge. And incidentally, did you notice that although the restrictive covenant was created by deed, it doesn't make it legal because restrictive covenants are a type of interest which can never be legal. And I covered this point in detail in my series on how to work out whether a property right is either legal or equitable. And did you notice that equitable easements and restrictive covenants or the type of interest which can only be registered as a land charge if they were created after the original land charges system was introduced in 1926. So if you have a pre-1926 restrictive covenant or equitable easement, then they can't be registered and they will fall under the common law doctrine of notice rules that I'm going to be looking at in the next video in this series. OK, so what about an option to renew a lease? This is where a tenant has the right in the lease to require the landlord to grant him a further lease when the current lease comes to an end. And it's the tenant's choice as to whether to exercise this right. So you can see that the section states that it must be a valid contract. So the rule is that the contract must satisfy the requirements for a valid contract in relation to land. And the rule there is that it must be in writing and signed. When we apply that rule, well, it is in writing and it is signed. So we can conclude that it can be registered as a C4 land charge. And incidentally, if you have a situation in an assessment where an option to renew a lease is in the original lease itself, which it very often is, then the original lease will usually be by deed, which of course is in writing and signed, so it will be a valid contract. Now this slide, if you're new to studying land law, then you might find this a bit too advanced for you at this stage. But if you're not new to studying land law, hopefully you will have come across the case of Walsh and Longsdale and other similar cases, which deal with how an equitable lease can arise when the parties don't create a legal lease. And the thing to note is that because you have a valid contract to create a lease, it can be registered as a land charge to protect it. So this point will often come up at the end of a question involving Walsh and Longsdale. So if title to the land is unregistered, 
Remember that if the general issue that you're dealing with is whether the lease takes priority over a new owner of the land, in other words, whether it's binding on the purchaser or not, then you will need to explain that it can be registered as a C4 land charge. So that's all I have to say on land charges. And on this slide, you can see what we've covered so far. In the next video, I'm going to be looking at the doctrine of notice. So the slide shows how all three elements of the unregistered title system fit together, which is what I'll be going through with you in the final video. Thank you so much for watching. I'm still relatively new to making videos for YouTube. So if you find them helpful, please give me some encouragement by subscribing and liking and sharing them. As it says on the on the slide there, I do work as a private tutor in land law and I also cover equity and trusts. So if you are interested in discussing private tutoring sessions, I put my email address on there. Um, I also have a Facebook page and I'm on LinkedIn. So you can message me that way too. Just look out for the watermelon sign. I'm also on the student room as Law School Hack. Again, just look out for the watermelon. So if you want to see the sort of questions that I can deal with, have a look at some of my posts in the Law Study Forum. But please don't private message me on the student room site because they don't like it. Thank you so much for watching and good luck with your studies.